Okay, well, first, let me. Uh, I'm thanking you, Korba. Thanking Korba uh, for uh, fighting the Bay Bridge traffic to come here in time. And uh, welcome to everybody. We have such a diverse group. We have people who study uh, rheumatic diseases. I always like saying rheumatic diseases, it sounds so British. Um, <laughs> post-traumatic stress disorder and hepatitis C and how they go together, uh, cancer prevention, um, cancer communication and, and cancer genetics, mathematical modeling of salt and sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh -huh. We're the main linguist out of you yet. Um, I studied uh, diabetes and chronic disease. Um, but all of us are, are unified in our um, approach to um, studying these diseases through the lens of health communication. So I'm really excited to have Alexa McRae here. And I'm going to make a very short introduction because she said her entire slideshow is an introduction <laughs> about what she does. Um, and Alexa is in town um, for an event honoring a colleague, right? Who is that? Um, uh, so, uh, Morris Collin. Morris Collin is, a, uh, is celebrating today, um, 11, 12, 13, minutes. His hundredth birthday, okay. and he is one of the founders of the field of medical informatics that we now call biomedical informatics. Still goes into the office, and we're throwing him a party. Where does he work? Where? where does he work? At Kaiser Permanente. He's, okay. he's had his career at Kaiser Permanente. Yes. I've never heard of him. His name again? Is Morris Collin. He goes Morris by Collin. Maury, Maury okay. Collin. Okay. And in our field, we've created a um, an honorary award, which is sort of the highest award that you can get in in his you know. In which is now 15, 20 years ago. And in any case, it's a wonderful So anyway, so I took advantage of the visit um, by inviting her to come and give a seminar. I want to thank you, Alexa, for taking me up on that invitation. Sure. Because you could have been hanging out at your hotel, Hotel Club Monaco, which is a very hip hotel. Yeah. Getting a massage. She went up and optioned my book when I picked up the hotel. Hotel Monaco. Wow. Wow. That was cool. She said we could um, crash at her hotel room after the talk. <laughs> uh, she is the co-director of the Center for Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. She's an associate professor of medicine um, at Harvard and the Department of Medicine um, at the BI, Beth Israel. Um, she's also the associate director of the Francis A. Conway Library of Medicine and the former director of the Lister Hill Center for Biomedical Communications, the research division of the National Library of Medicine. Uh, at the NIH. Before joining the National Library of Medicine, she was on the research staff of IBM's T.J. Watson Research Center. She got her PhD from Georgetown and was on the faculty there for three years, and she conducted pre-doctoral research at MIT, so a couple of reasonably good institutions. Um, she is going to be talking about the language of biomedicine and um, really how linguistics and biomedical uh, informatics um, interact. Maybe we could just say one or two lines of each of us as we go around the room, just in terms of your interest and why you're here. So I'm Jennifer Barton, I'm a room therapist, uh, and have an interest in patient-clinician communication in rheumatoid arthritis, and share decision-making and development of decision aids for vulnerable populations. That's great. Uh, Chris Koenig, uh, trained as an applied linguist, um, but I study uh, patient-provider communication in various ways. So, mm -hmm. Good. I'm Anika Palmer. Um, I do cancer survivorship research, specifically health disparities, and I'm really interested in the follow-up care component of survivorship as, as it relates to patient provider communication, but also specifically with prostate cancer and treatment decision making. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm Galen Joseph. I'm trained as an anthropologist, cultural anthropologist, and I um, currently do research on uh, genetic counseling communication, and, um, and I'm also very interested in communication around I'm a mathematician at work in modeling, and I, uh, I think I'm very interested in communication, but I'm going to find out what, the, what it's all about in your view. Although <laughs> there, yeah, there are very different um, approaches to that, and mm -hmm. so this will be one. I think you know, uh, the kind of work that Dean does is uh, somewhat different related, and my colleague Rima Rudd, who I mentioned before, who has been working in health literacy for many years, also has a somewhat 
a different approach. So this is, this is the lens that, that I bring to it. Well, if we can get Pam to work on communication research, then <laughs> this will have been incredibly successful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, 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 so um, that's a tall order. And, and you're and, and uh, I'm Gato Gorley. I work here as a program coordinator with the CDP and also with uh, an innovation exchange project with California's public hospitals called Phoenix. <laughs> yes. And cameraman bar excellence. And cameraman. Okay, very good. Yes. Okay, so shall I go on then? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, I, I put this brief bio up because it actually um, relates to what looks like a um, a career that doesn't make any sense when you first hear about it. You say, well, how did a linguist become a biomedical informatician? You know, I, I deal with you know, genomic data, and how did I get from being a linguist to there? But actually, it's not that strange when you see what the uh, trajectory was that I had. So as Dean said, um, I did my training in linguistics, primarily in theoretical linguistics, although I did do some teaching of um, teachers of in bilingual education just as a, as a side interest. So I've always been interested in this question of uh, communication and how we better communicate, including health disparities and uh, the context of language and all of that. So I've always been interested in that. My main area of research in those years was more on the theory side, so the Chomsky and the transformation of generative grammar side of things. So I wrote a rather formal, the uh, formal dissertation and that's how I ended up at the Watson Research Center, because there was someone there who read my dissertation, I'm not sure exactly how it got into his hands, but decided that I was really a computer scientist, and what was I doing being just a linguist? And so I said, what do I know about, what do I know about computers? And he said, that's all right, we'll teach you, so come on up. So I uh, commuted for a year and a half from Washington, D.C. to Yorktown Heights, New York, Two children at home. Oh, great husband. And, uh, the, you know, How old were the kids? The kids were six and eleven. Yeah. So it was uh, it was a challenge, but it actually changed my life. It absolutely changed everything. Um, had I not done that, I would have had a perfectly wonderful career being a professor of linguistics. Um, but man, I've had a really great career as uh, in what I've been able to do. Uh, now the Watson Research Center. So those of you who are Jeopardy fans know that uh, Watson competed successfully, rather successfully, with other Jeopardy, with human being Jeopardy players, the best Jeopardy players. So uh, uh, Watson, uh, the research team at, at the Watson Research Center put together a, a very sophisticated natural language processing system. And there are some people, some linguists and uh, computational linguists who think, uh, who kind of look down their noses at that, but I'm not one of them because I think it's actually quite tremendous what they've done. And um, when, the, when, when Watson was being successful, I uh, looked to see whether any of my former colleagues, it was my group actually, I can take no credit for it, but it was my original group at the Watson Research Center um, that you know, then morphed into this. And one of my colleagues, um, my main colleague, actually my collaborator, was still there. So I called him up and congratulated him and so on. Uh, so then, but then when I had uh, decided that commuting was not something that I was going to do for my whole life. Um, I started looking uh, back in the Washington, D.C. area, and it turned out that Don Lindbergh, who is still the director of the National Library of Medicine, um, was starting a project called the Unified Medical Language System Project, which I'll talk about, and he was looking for a linguist. Go figure, he was an MD, and he just decided that if he was going to have a project you know, about language in medicine, it might be a good idea to have somebody uh, who had some training in that area. So it's very fortunate, and that really changed everything for me because it was an absolutely wonderful place to be. I was there for almost 20 years. Um, and then um, we, my husband and I decided in 2004 that we really loved Boston. We left our hearts in Boston. Some people leave their hearts in San Francisco. We left our heart in Boston. And so we decided so, so. So we decided to move back up to Boston, and that's why I'm now at Harvard Medical School. And I'll tell you a little bit about my work there. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about some of the projects that I have led, um, and um, well, actually, I think I've led all of these, um, and uh, how 
the fact that I am a linguist actually informed the decisions that I made in developing these systems and doing this, doing this work and doing this research. So if you look over on the right, this is just a, a little representation of what are the various components of language. And I think that, uh, so you as, a, as an applied linguist, you understand this, but I think others, when they're doing you know, natural language processing or they're working with text or they're working with um, doctor-patient, uh, doctor, uh, clinician-patient interaction, aren't necessarily, some are, but aren't necessarily aware that there are actually various components of language that are, in some cases, separable. So for example, if you're dealing with someone who speaks English as a second language, if they arrived here um, in the United States in, uh, during puberty, um, like Henry Kissinger, they may have lifelong accents, but they're absolutely fluent. So that, but, so that, but that's an important thing to remember because somebody like you know, Kissinger, of course, uh, was a very successful person. Some of the folks maybe with whom you all deal here are not necessarily successful and maybe, um, maybe uh, interpreting uh, the communication in inappropriate ways because there's a heavy accent and you interpret it as the person you know, doesn't understand what you're saying. In any case, there are many dimensions of that. So understanding the, the various distinctions, phonology versus um, the syntax, understanding how to express yourself. Um, and then the important fact, and for those of us who work in automated language processing of various sorts, the thorniest issue is pragmatics. Because there, that is the, that's what's really hard to get uh, a handle on. And it's, it's all the things that you all care about, which is the context, it's the, uh, you know, it's, it's the linguistic background, it's the cultural context, uh, it is the so-called domain knowledge, the way we refer to that when we're talking in sort of computational terms. That is, um, the meaning depends of the utterances and of the exchanges that you have depend very much on um, the, your knowledge of the domain. Nowhere is that more important and difficult than in biomedicine. So much of the miscommunication that happens uh, in interactions is that there are assumptions made in one direction or another about the level of knowledge that someone has in, um, that they bring to that dialogue, that they bring to that exchange. So all of these uh, factors are, are critical. And as I say, uh, I don't think that um, certainly not all of the projects that I've been involved in in my career have been able to uh, deal in a deep way with all of those. I would say, for example, the Unified Medical Language System was really more about the lexical system, about morphology, although uh, some work that I did there in creating a semantic network, which was trying to bring together uh, the meanings of the various terms and so on, was edging over into knowledge, world knowledge, semantics, uh, and pragmatics. So OK, so that's just a, a little. Um, image to think about. Can I, before we move off the yeah. image, can I yes. um, be a simple country doctor and say, ask you, can you define some of the, just simply define some of the terms like natural language processing? Yes, I'm sorry, terms? I actually took all of those slides out. That's I fine, but just like, past, you can do it quickly. You can do it quickly. All of those. Uh, so natural language processing is basically taking um, text be, it can be oral, uh, generally it's written though, generally it's written text, because mm -hmm. if you're working with oral exchanges, the first thing that you do is you transcribe that in such a way so that the computer can work on it. Um, so that natural language processing uh, is, I would say that in the early days, the, um, uh, the heyday of artificial intelligence, which would have been the 1980s, into the late 1980s, People thought that they were going to be able to do deep natural language processing, that is to say, to really understand the meaning of the text. I think that uh, where we are today is that something like Watson takes the approach that yes, you have some, you incorporate um, some of the rules of language that we understand. You know, a sentence consists of a subject and a predicate, the kind of thing you learn in maybe in fifth grade now. I learned in ninth grade, but maybe you learn in fifth grade. But in any case, it's 
um, that those are those rules. That, that language is also rule governed. There's a, there's a grammar, and that's syntax. There's a grammar to language, and uh, so uh, natural language processing systems have variable levels of sophistication in how they do it. I would say that most people. And the it is to understand. To, to understand language. So that's, I would say most people who claim that they have done natural language processing of text, whether it's biomedical text or whatever it is, have done nothing more than matching of regular expressions. And they call it natural language processing because, in a sense, you know, you've taken some de some text and you've turned it in and you've been able to find patterns in it. But that's not deep natural language understanding. Something like Watson, I think, put together rules of language, uh, lots of statistical methods uh, for um, getting to the right answer in this case uh, to questions uh, in, in the case of the, the Jeopardy. So phonology is a sound system of the language. It consists of phonetics and and phonology itself, phonemes. So phonetics are just the sounds that are yeah. possible in the language. Phonology or phonemes are the sounds that make a meaningful difference. So in English terms like bin and pin, um, the v, the, the voiced versus the voiceless, b and p, they signal a difference in meaning. In some other languages, that wouldn't or aspiration, like in some languages, if you said pin versus pin, that would signal a difference in meaning and so on. So those are those are the phonemes, those are the ones that make, make the difference in language. Morphology is interesting and very interesting actually in biomedicine because it's a study of the structure of words. And uh, we have words, yeah, words. Uh, so the, the, it's really lexemes, you know, the, the notion of a word is also a little difficult. The way that we look at it in text is generally it's, it's there are spaces, you know, you say if there are spaces, it's a word. But how about blood bank? So sometimes it's written as one word, sometimes it's written with a hyphen in the middle, and sometimes it's written as two words. Is that a word? Or is it, what is it? And so we talk about lexemes, these sort of meaningful units that are, um, that, 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 that make up the language, that make up the lexicon. In any case, so morphology is important in, in biomedicine because we have so many Greco-Latin terms, and if you can analyze those Greco-Latin terms, uh, you get um, at some of the um, some of the meaning, the underlying meaning, although it's a little bit fraught, uh, fraught with, different, uh, with um, some difficulties. But morphology has prefixes and suffixes, it mm -hmm. has root terms, and so forth. Lexicon is the the dictionary of the language, and that's the open system. The other systems, well, phonology, syntax, and morphology are so-called closed systems. Le lexicon is open. What do I mean by that? You can add as many terms as you want. As there is new technology, new words enter enter the system. We borrow words from other cultures and so on. And I would, as I said, I spent a good part of um, much of the work that I've done, uh, from certainly in the UMLS project and, and, and others, has been on the biomedical lexicon and what does that look like. The lexicon is also important because, for example, for verbs, again, it's something you learn in fifth grade, sixth grade. You have transitive verbs, you have intransitive verbs. So transitive verbs take objects, intransitive verbs do not take objects, they take different kinds of complements. That matters when you're doing natural language processing because you can take a sentence and you can look. You know, if you found the subject, then you can start looking for the verb, and then you can, if it's a transitive verb, you start looking for the uh, for the object, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's that's uh, um, uh, the lexicon. And then semantics and pragmatics, I've, I've listed them as being two separate things. Uh, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, there was a big kerfuffle about, you know, are they the same thing, are they different things? Um, you could say that semantics is basically logic and things like truth value, and I'll, I'll actually have a, 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 a bit of a discussion about that. Um, that it's, it's a formal meaning, and pragmatics is everything else. It's like, you know, it's everything. It's, it's world knowledge. It's, mm. it's uh, um, uh, cultural things that you bring into it. Um, so uh, I treated take take a um, uh, take two sentences. I treated the patient. I treated I treated the patient with AIDS, and I treated the patient with AZT. Do, do they sound like they have the same linguistic structure? They mean very different things. I, I treated the patient with AIDS. The patient had AIDS. I treated the patient with, with AZT is I used a drug to treat the patient. Mm -hmm. So how the heck do you understand that? I mean, that's if you're looking at the syntax, if you're just parsing, the, parsing that sentence, 
um, unless you understand the difference between AZT and AIDS. And, and the, the kind of work that I've done has been actually quite simple in that regard because I, you know, I tag um, a word like AZT, or an acronym in this case, uh, they're both acronyms, but I tag AZT as being a drug, tag AIDS as being a disease, and now a lot of other things fall into place. So you can do, uh, natural language processing is basically intractable, in other words, it's a hard problem, but there are tractable, tractable aspects of it. And, I, and certainly things like um, understanding, you know, being able to tag um, uh, items in the lexicon with, with semantic tags, uh, being able to do morphological analysis, those are all tractable. Uh, doing full natural language understanding is not. I'm just wondering. And I haven't even gotten past my first slide. <laughs> <laughs> we, can't, we can't do the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a notable slide, right? Yes, I mean, please. The, I'm um, sorry, I forgot your first name. Chris. Chris, yes. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the syntax, I mean, I'm, I'm, so I'm thinking of sort of the, I mean, in this, in this environment, which is the, the Center for Vulnerable Populations, um, you know, the, I mean, considering a syntax of closed system, I mean, and the interface between the, the, uh, the language used, the pragmatics of it, and the, I mean, the, the syntax as a closed, I mean, at least the, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the conception of English as having a very fixed structure, I mean, and then having somebody that's, you know, a, a speaker of black English or a speaker yes. of Latino English, I mean, where yes. there are some flexibilities um, within that syntactic system that impacts how language is used. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm wondering how NLP I, would sort of I agree, that. but I agree and I, I disagree, which is to say that, um, uh, for example, black English, is that, is that, you know, a misuse or a flexible use of standard English? There are many people who would say no. Sure. William Lavaugh, for example, who sure. you may even have studied, um, pointed out that black English is a the language and it's certainly a dialect within you know, within its, its own right. But um, but but I but I, I see uh, I see where you're going with this is that I think that the only distinction that, that is uh, might be worth making is that you take a sentence like Chomsky's uh, um, famous sentence, uh, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. So colorless green ideas sleep furiously is has no meaning, but both of us, and maybe others in the room, could parse that sentence. Sure. So in that sense, we know what the what the syntactic structure is. We just don't necessarily, we can't describe meaning to it, although I, uh, you know, I love that sentence and That's I have beautiful. wonderful ideas you know, about it. So I, I describe meaning <coughs> to, uh, to that sentence. But I mean, the point is made is that, that you can look at the structure and you can analyze the structure um, uh, understanding that there are rules. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't violate that, that uh, syntactic structure, which is, I think, what you're also saying. Okay. So. I have just one quick question, which is, when you apply these ideas to um, a, a language that isn't phonetic, like mm -hmm. Chinese, um, do you transcribe and change the characters yeah. into, like, pinyin or something? Yes, so, so interesting that you, that you say that. So every language is phonetic, but its writing system may not be phonetic. So Spanish, for example, is highly the writing system. It's you know, mostly, mostly you can, um, uh, you know, a letter reflects a sound. Now, but you're absolutely right. So for uh, language processing, natural language processing, uh, you, would, you would most likely transcribe. Although, you know, there, you could assign tags, for example, to, um, to Chinese characters and so on. So I actually don't know anybody who works in natural language processing in Chinese, but I would imagine that that would be the first step, that that would definitely be the first step. Yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so uh, let me start with the, with the UMLS project. Um, this, the UMLS project was actually started in um, 1986, and this was an idea that, as I mentioned, Don Lindbergh, the director of the National Library of Medicine, had. And 1986, um, some of you know the concept of 1986, but there was no World Wide Web. There was, I mean, there was an internet, there was an ARPANET, but, you know, there was, it wasn't that you could sit down and, you know, search across uh, multiple databases and so on. But there were many, there were already many databases in biomedicine. So um, NCI, for example, had a system called PBQ, which had data about cancer. 
um, the National Library of Medicine have uh, some 40 databases called the MedLars databases. One of them being now it's called PubMed, but it's really Medline, it's the biomedical literature. And so if you wanted to, for example, query something in the PDQ system, which was cancer oriented, and you wanted to link that to the medical literature at the time, you really couldn't do it through the language because you kept getting coming up against language barriers, so to speak. So the, uh, the cancer databases used cancer terminology and you know, it was quite uh, detailed. The medical subject headings were used to index the biomedical literature and they were a different vocabulary, you know, a completely different vocabulary from what was used, not completely, but um, heavily uh, different. So the idea was that you know, there are many data sources out there, and of course they've increased. So now we have, we have laboratory data, we have biosensor data, we have a lot of public databases. Increasingly, we have social networking where people are doing their own, you know, tagging and folksonomy, so to, as they're mm -hmm. sometimes called. Uh, people use their own terminology, and um, and and you're trying to make sense of all of this. So you have, you have, and then you have sites like patients like me, where patients themselves are putting data into a system and revealing actually quite a lot about themselves. So this this question here is that you know the the data sources have their own way of, of their own syntax, if you like, their own access um, methods. Um, some of them use standard terminologies. We're lucky when they do. Some you know, we're unlucky when they don't. Uh, some use homegrown terminologies and so on. So the approach in the mid '80s um, was to take a look at all of the terminologies that were out there. And some of these are newer than the '80s. So, for example, Go, the gene ontology, is a new, uh, a new thesaurus-like structure. It's something they're called now. Everything that looks anything like a thesaurus or a control vocabulary is now all of a sudden called an ontology, but okay, that's fine. So that's, that's what happens in the field. Remember how I said the lexicon, you could make things up? Well, ontology, that word was actually uh, stolen from the, the uh, philosophers and it has a slightly different meaning in philosophy. But in any case, uh, well known to all of you is the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases Terminology, and that's used everywhere in uh, patient record systems, so electronic health record systems, which of course now are uh, in the limelight. Um, the sometimes the only uh, tagging that you have, the only information that you have about the content, is through the ICD terminology, um, and uh, sometimes the CPT, which is the current procedural terminology uh, for the procedures. So the ICD for diagnosis, CPT for the procedures. Um, and then in the middle there you have um, subject headings um, and so on. And so there are other databases, other um, uh, terminologies. Uh, SNOMED CT is an, is an attempt to uh, have more rigor in, um, in medical terminologies instead of just using ICD, which from a sort of structural point of view is, is a very bad terminology. It's, it's, uh, it's not very internally consistent. It's getting better, and ICD-10 is coming out. Have you all um, switched to ICD-10 in your electronic health system? About to. Yeah, About yeah. to, and that's, that will be, it, it will be painful uh, to go from ICD-9. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you'd like to come, have me come and do some doctoring, I will. Uh, yeah, we know it's going to be your Yes. Um, and the gene ontology is, was created by the model organism community that got together and so people were working on Drosophila, some people were working on, you know, uh, on worms, other people were, whatever, they were working on different model organisms. And they wanted to, and sometimes in plants as well, not just, not just animals. And they wanted to be able to exchange their data in, in ways that made sense. So they got together as a community, and they decided they were, going, they were going to create something. They got funding from NIH, and it's hugely successful. It's been criticized for this and that and so on. Doesn't matter, it's wonderful. And it is living and breathing because people use it in all, all the genetic databases, use the gene ontology. And um, so it, it's a real success story is how, how to do a, if you like, a bottom-up uh, building of, of the system. But again, it's done by people who know the domain, who fully understand the domain and uh, continue to improve it. It's kind of open source. Kind of open source. It is, absolutely. In a sense, not quite open source, but co completely openly available. Yeah. You can contribute to it. You can about it and they'll make fixes and so on. 
So what was the approach to the UMLS? Remember, this project started in the mid-80s. Uh, today, uh, we've integrated about 100, probably more than 100, um, existing terminologies and ontologies. It, it includes this higher level ontology, which I called at the time the Semantic Network. Remember, I was working in the late 80s on this. And so it has things like you know, uh, attacks according to diseases, whether you're a disease, whether you're a drug, um, whether it is a, um, uh, a particular method. And uh, so the Semantic Network is actually uh, has been around now for over 20 years and is still used to tag all of the terms that are, that comprise the Unified Medical Language System. So what we've done, using some natural language processing, using some human creation, is we've integrated all of these terminologies in what we call the UMLS through the method source for the semantic network, and then our team created a lot of the uh, natural language processing tools that are used there. So for those of you who study linguistics, and I think Chris, I guess you're the only one, although you may have studied some in your anthropology work, um, this is sort of an interlingua approach, which is that you don't translate, you know, you don't map gene ontology to CPT, and then you have to map, map you know, gene ontology to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, yeah. and so on. You map them all into the UMLS, yeah. and that way you only have to do that mapping once. And so that's what happens in the metathesaurus. And this will make it a little bit clearer. So here's an example of how we do the mapping. So you have these various terms that come from sources. The terms are on the left, the sources on, are on the right. So you have renal cell carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma is Gravitz tumor, hypernephroma, nephroid carcinoma, adenocarcinoma of kidney, and renal carcinoma. And they all get grouped together into one concept unique identifier. So think of it, I think of a concept as being a cluster of synonyms. And uh, so you bring together all the synonyms, again, it's a combination of natural language processing and human curation, because what a Gravitz tumor and renal cell carcinoma have in, uh, what, what do they have in common string-wise? Nothing. They have nothing in common string-wise, but you know, through the processing and through the, um, uh, through the curation, they've been brought together. They have different lexical unique identifiers, renal cell carcinoma and carcinomas. It's really the same lexeme, but it's singular plural. So all of the so you know, to, to, it's partly to answer your question is that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of pre-processing. There's a lot there are a lot of details in getting this right and uh, understanding the difference between you know um, things like singulars and plurals and and. Uh, adding suffixes like uh, changing treat into treatment. These are all the kinds of things that you need to encode, or you can encode, and then um, you do a better job of making all of this happen. Would, yes? would you um, try to take the whole term Greywood's tumor and associate with this, with this family of words, or is tumor already associated with carcinoma? Very good question. That's an excellent question. So we, we, we do have a communication specialist in the making over here. Because uh, because in fact that's that's the question is do you do you break these terms down into their constituent words and then try to put them back together again? The answer is mostly no, you don't do that because what happens is that these many of these things have been so so called lexicalized. They become, they've got their own meaning, so they aren't necessarily the sum of the parts. Yeah. But there is some of that that you can do, and you can certainly do that heuristically for new terms that come into the system. So you get other kinds of carcinomas, for example, you at least know that's cancer. You get other kinds of tumors, in, in your example. Um, but the idea here is that together, all of these form one concept. So it doesn't really matter now, get back to what we were trying to do. We're trying to query across systems. It doesn't matter that PDQ might have used, um, let's see, they might have used adenocarcinoma of the kidney, and the literature did the indexing on renal cell carcinoma, and now it makes no never mind. Because, in fact, you're all linked together with the concept unique identifier. And so now you can query, and I can use whatever term I want, you know, of one of these, and then if I come with some other term um, that maybe system has never heard of, that's where our natural language processing work comes in and we do some heuristics and we've done a lot of heuristics in the systems that we've built behind the scenes if somebody comes in with something that isn't on that list, for example, of the concepts that we have, then we can do the kinds of things that we're talking about. We 
start taking it apart and say, well, what is this really? And then we can, in the end, come out with a standard concept that we can, once we have the concept, the, you know, the world is ours. So we can do everything with it. Can you just say what the other, like, so CUI is? Uh, sorry, CUI is a concept UI. LUI is a lexical UI. SUI is a string UI. So you see they're all different strings. And then the source is just the huh. source. There are millions of terms in the UMLS now, and hundreds of thousands of concepts that comprise the UMLS. It's a really great resource, and it's still going on, so it's a lot of you know, new versions get released. Um, the last I knew, they were being released quarterly, but it might be twice a year now. Um, and it's all, you know, it's all available. So this is, the, um, this is what I was talking about, that I created the semantic network. So here I just gave you a little piece of the semantic network on the top. You know, anatomical, a, um, uh, a fully formed anatomical structure is an, uh, an anatomical structure. Um, a mental, uh, a mental um, or behavioral dysfunction is a disease or syndrome, but there's a relationship between a body part and a body part is a fully formed anatomical structure, but it also uh, is, uh, contributes to a disease. It's a location of a disease or syndrome, for example. So those, those, there are different kinds of links there. And then each of those semantic types is linked to uh, actual concepts below. So things like um, cognition disorder is a mental or behavioral dys dysfunction. You know, the brain is a body part. Um, and so forth. So with that two-level structure, then, uh, you can take you can parse text that comes in and begin to understand some potential relationships between them among helping you in sentences like, uh, I treated the man with AIDS versus I treated the man with ACT. So this is that's kind of machinery that makes uh, something like that work. Uh, so then, um, uh, in uh, late 1997, actually, um, the FDA Modernization Act was passed, and um, in that in that act, there were about three paragraphs that demanded um, a database of clinical trials information. Um, it was one-stop shopping for both federally and privately funded trials, um, and uh, it basically said the legislation said uh, you need to tell what's the purpose of the trial, what's the eligibility, who can get into the trial location and how can I find out about it. Well, what drove that? It was that patients demanded access to clinical trials. Like and it's at this because of this project that I'm standing here and that I became a fanatic about, um, about health literacy and access to um, mm -hmm. biomedical information for families, for patients and families. And the real question is how are people making decisions? What can we do? Know, what can we do to improve evidence-based shared decision making on the parts of patients and families? And as I say, I became a fanatic. And so when I was creating and designing clinicaltrials.gov, um, I uh, kept in mind at all times the original audience and the original impetus for, clinical, for this database, knowing full well that lots of different kinds of people were going to be using it. You know, the researchers were going to be using it. All, you know, all kinds of people will be using it. But I tried to make this, this system um, as simple as I possibly could. We put in all of the UMLS machinery behind the scenes so that you had, you know, the, the processing that was going on in real time and you know, fast. But uh, that was all not obvious to the, um, to the user. Uh, so we first released it in 2000. Uh, and um, I started working on it in the uh, fall of 1998, so about 18 months later. Uh, we update the system nightly, and currently there are more than uh, 152,000 trials in there. And you can see that there are some spikes there, and uh, it's gotten only better because in the fall, so there was legislation, and the drug companies knew they had to do it. Some of them were reluctant, others were not, because you know, they had some proprietary concerns and so on. Um, the for the federal funds, people knew it was the right thing to do, but you know it's a lot of work, and they didn't really have the system set up, and so on. So, you know, there was there was a, a lot of negotiating and a lot of work um, 
on my part and my colleagues of, uh, sort of laying the groundwork and saying, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to help you with the tools and so on that you need. So if you already have a database, we'll write the scripts that will take the data that you have in your database and it will be appropriate for intake into clinicaltrials.gov. If you only have paper, we created a system that allowed you to enter your data into a system that we call a protocol registration system, which is now used by thousands of many, many people around the world. What happened in 2004, so we had the legislation, we had the system. What happened in 2004 was that the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors together came out with a, um, an editorial. And um, uh, these are the main medical journals. So BMJ, Lancet, and the Journal of Medicine, JAMA, all of the big ones. And they said, if you want to publish in our journal um, about the clinical trial that you've run, then you better have put your clinical trial information, it's really more just an abstract information, into a publicly available database at inception of the trial. Now why did they do that? Why were they motivated? Not because they wanted to make me happy, they made me very happy. That's not why they did that. They did this because um, people were not publishing negative results. People were changing um, the outcomes of trials. People were suppressing, diff, you know, arms of, sorry. Yeah. People were, were suppressing, you know, various arms of trials because things weren't actually uh, turning out the way that they wanted to. And so the journal editors put a stop to it. And they said, and so our system, of course, um, allows you to change things. Certain things <coughs> you can't change. It does allow you to change things, but there is a full audit trail of what you've done in your, um, on your trials. Um, then recently, and I, I don't, can't quite see the last date that I have there, but very recently, uh, there was further legislation passed that now requires results to be put into clinical trials. And once again, uh, that's because not all trials are um, published on, and sometimes you don't, at least you can see that there was a trial now, but you don't necessarily know what the results are. Um, so it, there's, there are many, many issues, and I, I don't want to make light of them. But this is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. There are many issues. There are protections that we have to put into place and so on. But it's, it, uh, it's the right thing to do. And I was very pleased to be able to implement it. Yes. So as part of the, I mean, as part of the UMLS sort of interface, is that um, an ordinary person can put in, plug in keywords like phase four, uh, right prostate here. cancer. OK, you got it here. I'm giving you the example. So I typed in Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, and that's it's just a Google-like box. Now there is a more there is a more advanced search, and what the advanced search allows you to do is is type in what the condition is, what the intervention is, and what the location is. For example, most people don't use it. Most people just use this. It's a Google-like search. Yeah. And so you put in your terms. So Lou Gehrig's disease is a rather informal way of referring to this condition. So what happens? You put that in, and what comes back is uh, right now I just chose which of the trials, and the screen's a little bit far away, but uh, you don't see Lovirax disease there anywhere. It's just amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it, all of these trials were retrieved, but why were they retrieved? Because here are the search details. So these are the recognized terms and synonyms. Lovirax disease, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and so forth. All of those were, you know, came through the UMLS project and are there behind the scenes. And so you could choose any one of these, and you will get the, uh, you will get the trials. Here. And are the, all these, what would be the CUIs? Exactly. One, one CUI. Right. Yeah. Now, in some cases, we've gotten a little bit fancier, and there are some related terms, and we give you those options. Now, in a record, you can see, are there, maybe, maybe you want to make your um, search a little bit more specific, because you're getting too many trials. There's terminology that helps you with related terms, but these are basically mm -hmm. And then um, here, this was, I think what I'm showing here is um, that, uh, oh, oh, I'm just showing you the record. So I'm just showing you the record here. So you can see that, again, at a glance, you can see what the, um, what the condition is and what the various um, interventions are. And then to your point, what phase. So this is the phase two trial. And then when you hover over that, you understand what's a phase two trial. And you may prefer a phase three trial. You may not prefer a phase one trial because a phase one trial just doesn't fit toxicity. So we help, we guide you through that. 
The other thing that we do is um, we link you to um, Medline Plus uh, terms, and I'm not sure, I think it's a little bit further down. Uh, so what is Medline Plus? Medline Plus is actually a resource that the National Library of Medicine has created that is meant for patients and families. So it's much, you know, the language is clearer, it's more understandable, um, and so forth. So now, if you come in for ALS, for example, you don't really know much about ALS, you click on the, the Medline Plus topic um, for ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and you get full descriptions. And most of, the, most of this information has been um, vetted and, and actually is created by the various institutes at NIH that create uh, health information for the public. And so you can go and you can get more, uh, I would call it just in time learning. And then this is just an example of a complete trial. I won't, I, won't, I won't hover on this for very long, but basically now you're getting quite a lot more uh, information in the, um, in the clinical trial. Um, okay, so as I said, I became a um, I became a fanatic, I would say almost, about health literacy through my work there and providing access to understandable information to patients and families. But you can't just be a fanatic and get things done. You actually have to do a little bit of research. So I did a deep dive into the health literacy literature. That's why I put my paper up there, just to tell you that I was, um, I thought, well, you know, it's going to be really important for me to understand, this was in 2005, 2006, to understand uh, what is, you know, what has the field of health literacy really done for us. Now, this health literacy report at about the same time, of course, I was not involved in this, I was a novice in the area, um, was the, the IOM report, and uh, Dean was actually wrote one of the, um, the chapters, one of the invited chapters to that, and my colleague, uh, Rima Rudd, uh, was actively involved in this, in this report as well. And I think it, you know, it was one of the first times when this was really laid out as an issue and as an important issue. I recommend the book to you. There's a lot that's happened since 2004, but I still absolutely recommend the book to you as a good starting place. And as I say, I did my review. Uh, I published it in our, in our um, informatics literature because there are very few people who were, you know, for whom this was even on the radar, that this was an issue. Of, uh, there, of course, there are many people who studied uh, what was it's often called doctor-patient communication, and sociolinguists, some anthropologists um, have uh, certainly studied that over time. But as a real field of investigation, I think it's uh, this really gave the field an imprimatur. I think. Um, mm -hmm. Don't you agree, Dean? Absolutely. Yeah. It was it was in nowhere bill before that. <laughs> <laughs> right, and now it's in more or less in somewhere bill. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> actually in Somerville is going yeah. on yeah. <laughs> as part of the Cambridge Health Alliance. But uh, in any case, um, so interestingly though, uh, and, and importantly, uh, this was not a lightweight approach to what is, what is literacy, what is health literacy. And the report, this is just an image from the report itself. It shows you, you know, that there are many aspects. And look on the far left, cultural and conceptual knowledge, and listening and speaking, uh, reading and writing, numeracy. And, you know, when people say that my, my bit of text is understandable because it's written at the fifth grade level, at the sixth grade level, are they doing any of that? No. What they're doing is they're using readability formulas right. that have been developed for assessing school grade level, K through 12, and they're applying this to materials for adults. But they pat themselves on the back and say, well, you know, I ran this through, you know, Flesh Kincaid or, you know, the Fry Readability. And, uh, and so, and it's got a, it's fifth grade or it's sixth grade. Maybe it started out at 11th grade and I fixed it up a little bit and now it passes and so it must be understandable. Well, look at that. That's like one little part of this picture of what comprises literacy and, and by implication health literacy. So that's, I think that's been a real problem for the field because many, many papers have written, been written about this. And what's it about? If you're lucky, it's about word familiarity, as in Dale Chaw. But usually it's just words per sentence or syllables per word. And you know, how many sentences are there in the text? And that's just a very small part of 
what literacy and health literacy really are. So that took me down a, a, just a very brief byway, and I think uh, this is, I had a phone conversation with Dean about this, and, and she pointed Dean to a colleague at Memphis who uh, has done some interesting work. He's now in New Mexico. He was now in, in New Mexico, and his um, uh, uh, work on cohesion and coherence. And again, it's, 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 it's not easy to get a handle on all this, but it's something that we need to think about as we are thinking about improving communication with patients and families. So what is cohesion and coherence? Well, generally this refers to aspects of a discourse or a text, and there's a lot of research just generally in this area of cohesion and coherence. One of the first uh, books was written by uh, Michael ha Holliday, Halliday, I should say, in the 70s, 1976. It really laid out um, what, what these terms are. Uh, so cohesion is important because it Cohesive ties, in particular, because they 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 bring they bring elements of the text together, so you can follow the thread of the story, so to speak. You follow the thread of the discourse, and so so examples of cohesively related items are pronouns and, and their antecedents, um, and they, they link uh, bits of text, and they form a kind of if you like a semantic edifice, um, and it, it really distinguishes the text from a disconnected sequence of sentences. Why do I say that? Because much of what happened when people were trying to get their readability levels down is they would take a sentence that had, you know, that had multiple clauses and so on, and they would chop them up into so-called simpler sentences. By virtue of doing that, they lost the cohesive ties between and among the sentences. So it ended up being just a list of sentences without those cohesive ties. For example, things like conjunctions, ands, also as in furthermores, or however is it on the other hand, or indicating causality, therefore because, first, next, meanwhile, and so on. So that gets that is that often got lost. So I think in the end, what happened was that these texts that were, you know, let's say, 11th grade level, before you started applying some, you know, something to them, uh, so they could get down fifth or sixth grade level, they they were harder to understand than the ones that were at 11th grade level. Remember, measured only by, by word and sentence length and so on. Because all these things were lost, the therefores, the because, the howevers, and so on, they, they, they were lost. And I'm sorry to say I've forgotten, I have it in my paper, but I've forgotten um, the name of the person. Someone actually did a study of this uh, to show that it impeded this kind of simplification, impeded understanding. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's, really? it's referenced in my paper, so I yeah. think okay. I, you can take a look at it. Uh, now, coherence is, is slightly different. They're, they're related um, notions, but it's a um, sort of it's a cooperative thing because it depends on the, you know, it's the it's the interlocutors. It's like the relationship between the speaker and the listener, and then the listener becomes the speaker. Um, so uh, writers who do this, you know, they. They assume that, that they make lots of assumptions about their interlocutors, about the, or the person who is you know, reading the text. They make assumptions, whether the assumptions are, for example, if you're writing a text for your colleagues in medicine, you assume that they have a medical background, they have a medical education. If you are writing for somebody else, maybe you don't make those assumptions, or you try not to make those assumptions, although you sometimes, you sometimes do. So the um, H. Paul Bryce, who was a philosopher who wrote in the 70s, uh, talked about the cooperative principles. And many people who do discourse analysis still refer back to this. The communication is basically expected to be true in evidence space, as informative as necessary and relevant. It needs to be clear. Perspicuous is interesting that you use the term perspicuous. You use the word clear. Right. But in any case, uh, avoiding obscurity and ambiguity and being brief and orderly. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean that every communication event is that. It's just that you violate that. Um, when you violate that, you violate it for a purpose. So one of, the, one of my favorite examples from this is um, he has a letter that somebody is writing um, as uh, being supportive for uh, you know, this person becoming a, uh, an assistant professor, let's say, at, at, or a teacher at a, um, at a college or, or, or a high school. And the, the letter says something like, um, Mr. So-and-so, 
uh, speaks English very well and is always on time, you know, and dresses nicely or something like that. There was nothing negative in that. But what it, you know, what happened here is that it certainly wasn't as informative as as was necessary. It was true and it was evidence based because I know that he always showed up on time, you know, for my classes and that sort of thing. Uh, but was it really relevant? No. But that was a way of still writing them a letter of reference, um, and but at the same time saying, no way in the world should you hire this person. <laughs> but there wasn't a single negative term in there. It's, it's a lovely little example. I haven't read it in years, but it's a lovely example. I think some of well, I won't go there. Um, okay. So this this you some of you may be uh, Dean. You may be familiar with this. This is from the Dokes. This was a an example of an informed consent. I'll say, before you go on, so could, yes. could you, again, simple country doctor stuff, the one-liner of cohesion versus coherence? So, co yeah, cohesion... It's, it's cohesion is within a text, within it's a within narrative, a text. as it's opposed to between people? You got it. Okay. Nicely said. Exactly. And I think there's, it's clearer, like, cohesion has, like, clear linguistic markers, like pronouns and conjunctions kinds of things you can point to, whereas coherence is more interpretive. Interactive. It's more interactive. It's like, exactly. you know, what was presumed, what's not presumed, what's presented versus implied, I mean, in that way. Exactly. Reading between the lines is an example exactly. of, you know, coherence, coherence. or violating coherence. You know, right. It's, it's right. manipulating coherence, you know, right. way to right. say it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as the simple um, uh, country doctor here has probably seen this example, which is <laughs> from the dose. Yeah. And um, this is an informed consent example. And you don't have to read it, but you know, it just goes on and on. You know, being a woman or being invited to participate in a research and investigation to determine the efficacy of the two methods and so forth. So it really f it fails as a well formed communication event. Um, there are very few cohesive devices, there are passive structures. You know, why can't we just say, we're, you know, we invite women? Women are being invited. Why, 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 why let's say it that way? Difficult vocabulary. There are lots of assumptions. There's pretty heavy cognitive load in this. And, um, and importantly, there's a strong power imbalance here that you see in the last sentence. It's almost, you know, it almost has the opposite effect from what I think they meant. These are, this was not written by bad people. Just the last sentence is, if you want to get out of the trial, you can. Such withdrawal will not compromise <laughs> or interfere with the individual's ability to receive medical care at this institution. If that doesn't sound legalistic, I don't know what does. And it, it really has the opposite effect. I mean, they mean to say it won't have any negative impact on you, but the way they say it, it's, it almost sounds like a threat, you know. So it, it just fails. And um, uh, so they rewrote it. And look at this. You're asked, you're asked to take part in a study that looks at ways to help pregnant women stop smoking. You want to find out if a woman in a videotape can help women stop smoking. You also want to find out how, many, how nurses can help women and so forth. It's a little bit choppy, but it's uh, certainly a lot clearer, and you can get the, and the last sentence, it will not get in the way of your care at this clinic. Nice way to say that. Yeah. Now I feel better. Now I can sign. <laughs> can you talk to lots of IRBs about that? Because a lot of times can't get past IRB because of all right. that. Well, but again, the, the IRB is interesting because it, it uh, is, was established to protect patients, but it, it serves another role as well, which is to protect the institution. And that's where the, that's the rub. That's where the problem comes in. And so you need to, uh, you know, at the same time, make sure that you've covered yourself as an institution, um, but you also are required to make sure that your patients understand. So, in fact, in the IRBs, people who work on IRBs, um, often now insist on readability levels being, you know, sixth grade or eighth grade or something like that. But unfortunately. As we just saw, you can get to that readability level, but you get to full understanding. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that you do necessarily. So just to go on with this example, so that here there are multiple cohesive uh, chains. Uh, it adheres well to the cooperative principles. It's true. It's as informative as is necessary. It's relevant. It's brief. It's orderly. And so this is a nice application of those, uh, you know, cooperative principles as well. So you've got cohesive ties. But do you believe that? this is correlated with a person's literacy level? In other words, do people who are more highly literate, is, is it possible that they may create less cohesive, I think I'm being the right one, yes, yeah. less cohesive text 
than someone with a lower level of literacy. Would create such a text? Would create less cohesive text. Uh, oh, I'm not sure about that. But or or are, they, are they correlated, I guess? I, so this could be a very long discussion, but I think that there is um, there is a, a feeling that um, uh, how can I say this without um, <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit with how, how to say this, but uh, let me put it this way: I think that we should all be using what's called universal precautions now, right. so that everybody appreciates clarity of expression. It okay, doesn't fair matter, so okay, it doesn't would be matter a standard. where you are. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're a highly educated yes. um, yeah. you know, astrophysicist or a highly educated whatever you might be. This is an aspirational. It is. Yeah, it right, is right, okay. I think that clarity of expression and universal precautions <coughs> is the way we have to go. And we do need to get away from yeah. And I don't think you were saying that because I know your the kind of research that you do. Yeah, I, but we need yeah. to get away it's a from different saying research question. Yes, yeah, I got from it. saying that the you know a person is has low literacy and another person has high literacy. Well, in, Who cares, right? for, Re but, well, to, but yeah. but for what in relationship to what? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, the astrophysicist is going to be able to read you know her papers in astrophysics in a better way than I can. But if that if she wants me to understand that paper, you know maybe she could write it in a slightly different way so that I, as a relatively educated individual, would be able to understand it. So I have a perfect example of this actually. I mean, and one of the um, one of the projects that I'm working on is um, in it's in the cancer context involving um, entry into phase one clinical trials, and so we're doing ethnographic longitudinal studies of people sort of to see sort of how things change over time. Anyway, so um, there was actually somebody with two physics degrees that I interviewed immediately before and immediately after sort of entering into a phase one clinical trial. Um, when I asked him about his informed consent process, um, you know, he said he dug out the 50-page document, and I said, well, great, I mean, you have the informed consent. Um, he had some highlighting throughout. He said, well, you know, what, what do you understand the risks of this to be? Said, I don't know, I couldn't really understand it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he, and, you know, I mean, so, I mean, again, like, you know, here's somebody highly literate in his field, I mean, but when it comes to sort of emotional content, the fear around sort of what this actually means, I mean, he could sort of go on and on around the, the, the physical, the physics of the treatment, um, but when it actually came down to what it, how it might impact him, I mean, he, he really could reproduce that. This is why, it, actually, what you were just saying is in, in the moment of getting an acute diagnosis, for example, if, if you go to a doctor and everybody knows this, and the word cancer is used, you hear nothing else. Yeah. You hear nothing else, which means that, so this is why, it's one of the reasons why I like to uh, talk about just-in-time information. You may just not be ready at that moment, but let's create resources that allow you to go back, you know, in the fullness of time, and you're calmer, and you've had some time to integrate this. Uh, and then you, you're ready for the resources, and then you're ready to get the information, then you're ready for the drawing, then you're ready for the, Um, I, one thing that I've just seen a lot of is, is you just get information overloaded. and I think this was a nice example of that, but it seems like everything you sign consent for um, has, uh, you know, all kinds of things that might happen, including death. And right. It's like the whole thing. <laughs> and it's just totally impossible to, uh, you know, do anything except say, i got to sign this. Together, you know, whatever is Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're well aware of how how, um, how bad all of us are at assessing risk and even understanding risk and understanding what even what the numbers mean. You know, that that uh, and, and how to interpret all of that. So that's why, if you go back to the and I won't go back to the slide, but if you go back to the um, the IOM uh, picture, uh, you know, there was like numeracy hanging out there on the right. Numeracy is something that is just beginning to be uh, studied and understood. And there are some people, Jessica Anker is somebody who's done some very interesting work uh, recently in this area. Um, but in any case, so you know, the whole question of understanding risk is, uh, yeah, so what does it mean, death? And if there was how many deaths and, and, and you know, over what period of time? And, right. and, and based on the... And it, lets, it doesn't really help you 
decide whether to do something. It ends up being just a formality. You know. Well, there you are. You're you're in your hospital gown and you're being ready to be wheeled into the operating room. You're inside. Are you inside or aren't you inside? You don't sign. You got to get dressed again. You don't get your operation. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so I wanted to talk just very briefly about um, our CTSA. I understand that you also have one. Um, I got involved in the informatics part of that, but also in the um, community engagement uh, parts of that. And um, we did a little research project, in, which I called the Public Communication Initiative, and created a resource uh, that is openly available um, called Community Connect to Research. And then we did a formal um, evaluation of that. Uh, so here it is, and the idea is that it's meant for people in Massachusetts. So I, I, anybody can use it, but there's information in here that's targeted to uh, patients and families in Massachusetts uh, with trust, trustworthy um, information. And I partnered, so we have high quality health information. Uh, I partnered with the Harvard Health Publication. So uh, Tony Komaroff, who is the editor in chief of the Harvard Health Publication. Uh, was willing to work with me to give uh, uh, give us text for various conditions um, that was written specifically for patients and families, so understandable text. So you can see that we have health topics in these various areas. You can search, but you can also browse. And then here's what a topic would look like, coronary artery disease, what is it, uh, how is it treated, what is its prognosis, and all of the articles have that same format. Mm -hmm. and Pretty, pretty understandable uh, text. And then lots of interlinks in them that we've done. We have glossaries. We created a glossary that allows you uh, to look up words that might be hard for you to understand. Um, so atherosclerosis is there. Yes. When, when you say, you know, people gave you this, this text and it's pretty mm -hmm. understandable, mm -hmm. like, do, did you give them certain parameters for what understandable is? I mean, did you use the principles that you've been it's, you know, it's it, they've been in business for quite a while, and they have MDs who they have trained uh, to write this kind of text. They do formatting and so on. But indeed, we did have discussions about it, and they did make some changes to how they were presenting their material, and um, spent some time in looking at the literacy demands of the materials that they had already created. So, I'm I'm hopeful that, that our intervention also made a difference in uh, these texts, but they were well on their way to understanding how to do this. So, um, so what we've done then is we, we've linked these, these topics are all linked to the clinical trials that are going on in Massachusetts, so that this is locally, so you can see how many trials are going on in Massachusetts. And what this really is, is just a window into clinicaltrials.gov. Mm -hmm. So I created a search strategy that regularly pulls out all of the trials, which sounds like it's easy, but it's not really because people don't use, they don't use control terms, they misspell things and so on. But in any case, so we, we, we are um, in real time getting the, I think actually we do it nightly, but getting the trials that are going on in Massachusetts. And then those trials then are linked. When you get to the trial, then you, you get the link back mm -hmm. to the topic so coronary artery disease, for example, you get the link back to the topic. In the case that we have, in the case that Harvard Health Publications hasn't done that, we link them to the Medline Plus topics. So we did that with, um, uh, and there's this whole section on understanding health research, and we we talk about some of the uh, some of the failures of clinical research that have happened, and some of the not so ethical things that have gone on in the past. We, you know, this one needs to be open truthful, forthright about what's happened in the past and what we're doing to, uh, to mitigate that. So you know, what is it? Is it safe? Is it, is it right for you? Maybe it's not right for me. A, a clinical trial doesn't, won't, won't necessarily do anything for me, but it might do something for humanity. So the fact that I go into a clinical trial could have a positive impact on somebody else. And then I was really delighted because I set aside, I, I was able to get a um, one of the ARA supplements, the American Recovery and Investment Act, to this uh, CTSA uh, for community engagement. And it set aside um, some dollars to work with community health centers. And so we chose uh, four community health centers. Uh, there they are. 
and uh, we did a full NIH kind of review. We had uh, we had 17 proposals. Where I put together a study section of members of the public as well as uh, other experts, and um, we chose these four. And they they were all wonderful projects. Uh, the Duffy Health Center is down on the on the Cape, and they work with homeless people or people who are um, at risk of homelessness. So what did they do? You know, our, the idea was to look to see how can we address some of the health literacy issues. And what they said was the first problem that these people have is that they don't know how to use computers. So as part of what they did is they taught them how to use computers so that they could use a computer to get a job at Stop and Shop because you have to log into a computer to fill out your, you know, your information and so on. So I thought it was brilliant. They could put those things together. Uh, and then finally, and I'm coming to an end, um, probably most recently, um, I've been heavily involved in the Boston area um, Autism Consortium. And where we, what we're doing there is we're correlating phenotypic and genetic information, genotypic information in ASD, autism spectrum disorders. We recruited, I, and I didn't personally do this, but the, the, the group did, recruited more than 500 families. They collected data. Uh, blood samples not only from the affected child, but also from the siblings and the parents. It's a wonderful resource. They apply these behavioral instruments. They administer these behavioral instruments, which is the only way, I don't know if any of you are familiar or work in autism, but uh, the only way really of diagnosing um, uh, autism or anything on the spectrum is through these behavioral instruments. You ask lots of questions or surveys. You ask the parents. You ask the individuals. You want to do some observation and so forth. And they used. Um, um, more than two dozen uh, instruments. So what we did, what our group did, is we developed an ontology that aligned and integrated the terminology in these phenotypic instruments. So for example, so all these data are in a database now, and if somebody wants to know, you know, give me the cohort of children ages, you know, three to five who display self-injurious behavior, do they have to know that it's called headbanging in ADIR, and it's called hitting your head against the you know, against the wall or skin picking or, or self-biting in Vineland? No, they don't need to know all of that. I mean, we'll show them that. But what we've done is essentially brought that together and we've mapped all of the about 5,000 questions that comprise those instruments into our ontology of less than 300 concepts. And it's openly available, and I'm very pleased to say that it looks like it will become part of the National Database of Autism Research. You know, you're, you're, so that example really raises the question of whether or not some of the work you and others are doing actually can be used for diagnostic history taking. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there is some probably commercial endeavors that are trying to enable patients to self-diagnose, but um, are you familiar with any work that's been of, of value that has suggested that those types of approaches can help narrow a diag diagnosis the, in people the, with complaints that right. are far-reaching? There is the Ian database at, um, uh, it's called in Ian Interactive Autism Network at Hopkins, and they have people, generally parents, because autism is generally you know, managed yeah. by the parents of the autistic individuals. And um, they have them put data into a, a structured system so that then they can come back and right. do more analysis. So there is some work going on in this area. You don't, I, I should, I want to put in a caveat because to some extent this is a reductionist exercise. Yeah. A lot of what I've done in general has been a reductionist exercise. You take something very complex and you reduce it to something that's manageable and computable. And it has a lot of benefits, but you don't want to take sure. observation out of it. Yeah. You don't want to take observation out of it. And you don't, you know, you don't want to take uh, listening to the parents and all of that. You don't want to take that. But but as a first step, and cool. so in fact what we did, well anyway, here it is. Oh, it looks like the arrows didn't uh, this was, the, uh, so, uh, we have the first example of where the translation didn't work, because there were, there were arrows for these. The, uh, ma the Mac translation. The Mac, the Mac right. to the PC. Yeah. It's the only Sorry. place that this happened. Okay. But anyway, there are three major categories. Personal traits, social competence, and medical history. So all of these areas, cognitive ability, executive function, and so on, are uh, personal traits. And then, of course, as, as I'm sure you all know, um, there's a social interaction component of, of autism that is diagnostic, really, in many ways. And then there's a lot of medical history. 
But what we did then is we took that ontology and we looked at how it was represented in the different instruments because there had to be overlap. In the different instruments. In the okay. different instruments, there had to be overlap. So what we did then, oops, sorry, that's but, there's, last slide. but they're quite different. So exactly, you can see at a glance, but then we actually created, I didn't show this, but we created a formula whereby, depending on what you care about, you can put you know three or five of them together and you can get a pretty good picture. And we have different different things that you might be looking at. For example, if if you have all the time in the world, then maybe you want this set. So now nobody has all the time in the world, but you've got enough time, you might want this, this set of instruments. If you already have people at your institution who are trained in ADIR, the Autism Diagnostic Interview um, Schedule, then by all means use that one, and then maybe you just need to supplement it with a few others and so forth. So we, we created a formula that allows you to do that, and we, and we just, we just put, publish this in neuroinformatics. Anyway, coming to my last slide. Obviously. <laughs> but I mean, the language is complex. However, I am I am truly an optimist and and I believe that you know we just need to do. So we can develop methods to mitigate the complexity. They're going to be imperfect methods, but there's lots more work for all of you to do. And so that's what I'm doing. Thank you. So thank you. Can I, can I start off with a question that I probably was going to ask you on the phone but didn't have time to when we spoke. Okay. Um, we, we somewhat disparagingly referenced the flesh kincaid and the smog and all, all these methods to assess readability of text. Um, and I will admit I am uh, enamored by the idea of text cohesion as a, as a more appropriate measure of general clarity. Um, has any work been done to examine the correlation between those two or to, to, to study which of the two would be more valid with respect to what we're trying to predict, I, which is understandability? You know, I, I think that there is, there's absolutely a role for the readability metrics. You know, I don't think we need to throw, throw them away. Okay. There's a role for them. But I, I think, again, if you think about that IOM picture, it's only mm -hmm. one small part yes. of that picture yes. that you're addressing. And that, yes. that's the only point. Yes. And smog, for example, we've used smog too. And smog is pretty good. I mean, it's pretty good at what it does. It's just that you have to know what what the tool is meaningful. for. Right, but if you and were so, to have two if you were to have a, a document and uh, and your goal was to enhance comprehensibility. Uh, Jennifer's Jennifer created a wonderful guide for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Coffee. Yeah, get, get your coffee, get your bacon. This is the hard question. I know. Uh, get some glucose in there. <laughs> and she um, she had a lot of patient input into its content, into its layout. I presume you did some readability testing on it, yes, maybe and not. We had, a, we had a health literacy expert, you know, Jenny Anderson, I think. They did a readability she, assessment of that, or, you know, or I, was I it more? I don't know if she formally did, but she, yeah, I, don't know. I mean, she But, but like let's it. say we subjected that booklet, which is quite nice, mm -hmm. to a readability formula of some kind. Right. Versus a, a, a cohesion measure. Um, which of the two would more reliably or validly predict comprehens comprehensibility? Is it possible to know? I don't know. I just don't think you should do those in isolation. Why would you do okay, those so in isolation? Okay, so are they right, complementary? So they're are they complementary? complementary. They're absolutely so, complementary. So tell me why they're complementary. Um, what, are the dif what, are they, what are they doing that are, that are different from each other? Well, the, the readability formulas are looking at <clears throat> Sentence complexity and I'm going to do yep. uh, Sentence complexity and you know word length, for yep. example. Yep. Um, in some cases, I you know the longer word is absolutely the right word. I mean, why would you want to? Why would you shorten? Uh, I can't think of Rheumatoid. <laughs> well, rheumatoid arthritis. Right. I mean, that that's, that's a what term of art. That's what it is. Right. So if you start mucking around with that, you're actually impeding understanding. So I think that um, looking at something like, I would say smog is probably among, among the better ones, but looking at, at that and seeing what you see and seeing where the problems are. Because so I think the issue is that it's not just the final number. You're saying use it as part of the process. Use it as it. part of the process. See, Use it as a debugger, if you like. Use it as a way of highlighting 
where the potential areas are. And then you can overrule because you say, oh, no, no, rheumatoid arthritis is exactly the right, the right term here. Why should I, um, you know, and this is the clinic that they've come to and it would be, it would make no sense to right. change that term. So I think that using it as, as a device for, as an alert, as an alerting system, okay. that might be the way to do it. Okay. Rather than just saying, you know, send it through the system, I got fifth grade level, I'm done. Mm -hmm. No, that's So that's I when you're using it to create content. It's, oh, exactly, absolutely, okay. to create content, to create, con and, and then to assess content too, to assess, but, but I mean, assess it in the sense that you may, you, if you wanted to compare, you know, using uh, two different versions of something, uh, for different audiences, you, why not use that and then mm -hmm. you use that to make Okay, where is the measure of cohesion in the same example? Where would she right. be using that? How would she be using that? She would similarly. be using it similarly because she would, she would look to see, you know, where are there, um, is this just, you know, a, a, a list of a sentences? Laundry list. Yeah. A, laund a laundry list, is it just a laundry list? Now people say, actually, Plain language guide, which you're familiar, familiar with. Um, NIH came out with uh, uh, plain language principles, and um, and then um, I think uh, uh, ARC came out with the uh, universal, universal precautions. precautions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I recommend that you take a look at that because uh, those those basic principles of plain language, you can identify those as as part of the process that sure. you're working in. So you could, that, but in but any case, I, I got I went on a detour because. Lists are actually helpful in, in some cases. They're absolutely helpful because additional white gives you additional white yeah. space. It helps you, you know. But if those lists are just, if you just take a paragraph and turn it into a list of sentences and get rid of all the conjunctions, mm -hmm. then you lose the then you completely lose the thread. Not completely, but you do lose the thread. You're not you're not helping the reader in the story that you're trying to tell because we're all telling stories and it's these interconnections. Right, you lose the narrative. The referring, exactly, you lose the narrative and the referring back and the reminders. And, and also, there's nothing wrong with redundancy. Mm -hmm. Language is full of redundancy and as long as it's not patronizing redundancy, then I think there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. So there's definitely a place for that. Yep. And, um, yeah. I'm wondering about um, when I when I was um, when I was teaching um, about Grace. Um, you know, Grace is a philosopher. I think this is the first time I've ever had someone in the audience. You know, past my linguistic days. I mean, no, my you, but, yeah. we've all studied Grace. Of course, yeah. we've all, we're I mean, all big Grace people. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, because Grace. I mean, while it's uh, these quadrant principles are kind of ideal. I mean, they're an ideal to be reached for. You know, the sort of the perfect perfect text or the perfect conversational something mm -hmm. contribution mm -hmm. might you know adhere to these principles in some ways. But I mean using the cooperative principles as a kind of metric for gauging coherence is very, very slippery slope. I mean it's very difficult to say, well, is this clear? Clear to whom? Clear yeah. under what under what circumstances? Is it informative enough? For what purpose? Right. I mean, but, in uh, what context? But I, I guess I would I would disagree a little bit with your premise, which is it's not. I don't think he was saying that these cooperative principles. Yes, they're aspirational, of course. But what he would, I believe that what he was saying is that the way that why language is so rich and why communication is so rich is that we understand those rules and we violate them with a purpose generally. Right. And that was my example of the letter, mm -hmm. letters of reference. Right. And so. And it's the same thing, sort of, you know, with syntax. You 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 you, you parse something, but it's but it's the meaning that you have to put on top of that. So, right. but so just to go on with what you were saying, I think yeah. that you use these principles as a guide. And again, think of it as alert as an alerting system. It might be a perfectly good way to look yeah, at it and say, is this really relevant mm -hmm. to the purpose here? Is it in, you know, am I really being informative enough? Am I being overly informative? As that first example of the informed consent, right, right. you know, form was. So. Now, just to point out that he's married to a conversation analyst as well. Also. <laughs> so, so, so oh this whole boy, thing oh about man. like, oh you know, man, what happens when like, you have an argument? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the whole thing strange. about collaborative, <laughs> blah blah blah. Right. Screen, screen <laughs> world. Um, I mean, it's sort of. I guess the next the next step to that is. Um, I mean, when when you know when we're talking about understanding. I think understanding is a gloss for a variety of different kinds of processes. 
and yeah. you can sort of understand passively or kind of get the gist of something. Yeah. But that's a really far jump from being able to act oh, and do something. Oh, of course. And sort of, I mean, so this the is skills. A, I mean, another thing that Jennifer has produced is she has these lovely cards um, for you know um, decision for making. decision making, basically where inter, you know there's an interaction about oh. okay, well, what kind of medication? Well, you know, how much does it cost? What kind of how do you take it? Is it a pill? Is it an injection? Yes. I mean, so where understanding is sort of more interactively constructed. Absolutely, and I think ways. that's yeah. another place where the IOM report did a really good thing because they defined health literacy in that in that way is that you know you have to be able to act on mm -hmm. and have the information to act on. You know, the the um, uh, the ability. To, it's not just understanding it. I'm just repeating what you sure. said. Not just understanding it, right. but being, being able to act on it. And so I think that the that brings you into a, into another realm of, you know, of social interaction it's and really communication. Yes. I mean, it's really hard to sort of, well, what does that even mean to be able to act on it? Yeah. Yeah, it is very hard. Yeah. I mean, Galen, before you take off, yeah, I want to make sure you, because you're doing some incredibly interesting stuff and have great primary data. That, yeah, I mean, what I was just thinking was, in some cases in the genetic counseling that I've observed, people don't understand, the patients don't understand what the counselors are saying a lot of what they're saying. There's a ton of information that's offered. And this is typically breast cancer risk yeah. discussions. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they're still able to make a decision that's reasonably informed about whether or not they want to take the genetic test. In, in the sense that they're, they're informed in the sense that they understand that it may help them um, uh, do things to prevent cancer or to help their children prevent cancer or so they have a sort of they have like they know the goal they know what's up yeah yeah but they don't, they don't understand they don't, the pathophysiology right right and you know one of my big questions in my research is you know how much do they need to know like you know and why I mean, is it is it condescending to say you know you need less information? But can I encourage you to look at it slightly differently? Because yeah. I think that um, it comes back to uh, how much information do you need at what at what point and in what context? Mm -hmm. So I would argue that yes, maybe for that first level decision that they have to make, uh, it's possible they trust you because it's a trust relationship that they've established with you. They trust you. They do because I mean you're an expert, and so they want to hear what you have to say. They'll probably often say, "Well, what would you do?" and that kind of thing, which is which is common. Um, but then it's also your responsibility, it seems to me, to point them to further information should they want it. Now, some people may not want it, so I would say you know to, to design things in such a way that there's an opportunity for further information. Right, well, and that's always the trick, I think, because I think it's very hard for the genetic counselors in the moment, and I think for any practitioner, to figure out, um, you know, how much more yeah. information <laughs> to give and how, how much more mm -hmm. the patient wants. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have these sort of packages of yes. information that they right. give in a very kind of standardized right. way, because they do it all day long, every day. Right. And it, then it becomes very difficult to, to sort of to go back to tailor it and to tailor it to the particular individual. Yeah. So I mean, we and then the, the other it's the a other, huge research question we're looking for. It's a huge right. research question. Yeah. It's really big. Yeah. And how many people decide before they even go in and get the information? So that's my question. That's mm -hmm. a really good how question. Often, too. How much of a difference does it act? You, you know, mean the conversation? People, well, how, yeah, yeah. How many people, do make people know what they want to do? Anyway. Exactly. I mean, this may be very naive. I'm just very curious how much well, I think, of the time. I think there are some some patients, but I think in you know in the settings here, like at San Francisco General and other public hospitals, a lot of times people walk in the room never having heard of genetic counseling or genetic testing for breast cancer, and so they they're just coming because someone called them and told them. To come. And and I would say probably the genetic counselors that haven't looked at any of the videos or heard any of are very few of them are asking questions at the beginning about people's conceptualization of the problem. Well, to even they to even ask what they know. Okay. And why they're here. They're, they so are they get a quick assessment, and but does that seem to lead to a fork in the road? Or? Well, I mean, the, the assessment is almost always that, you know, they First know why they're there. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's almost always Got the same it. thing. Got Occasionally right. they'll get somebody who has a lot more experience right. with it or, um, yeah. you know, a lot more knowledge. And then they, they do adjust for that. 
but there's very little adjustment kind of within that, the, mm -hmm. the majority. Is this real, I mean, the patient's just kind of cold like that because I, you know, I've just gone through genetic counseling at Kaiser, oh. and uh, there the model is they send you to a group presentation mm -hmm. first. And mm -hmm. So you get mm -hmm. sort exactly. of the common yeah. set of knowledge, mm -hmm. and then at the end of that, you have an opportunity to sign up for an individual appointment mm -hmm. with a counselor. Mm -hmm. And so you go into that appointment. Prepared. You know, yeah. Right, with mm -hmm. questions. Well, and interestingly, I mean, the counselors here developed a, a video. Video, yeah. Um, but it's almost never, never used. used. Yeah. Wow. Oh, does it get does it get mailed to the house? No, of course not. No, um, and, but, but they just watch it in the waiting room. Well, that's that's the big the question. Problem. Is where do they watch it? Yeah, right. And you know, where where can people watch it? I mean, you know, does everybody have access to watch it at home? Which most, I mean, a lot of the patients probably don't. I mean, maybe if it could be sent to their phone, <laughs> they could watch it on their phone, that would work. Mm -hmm. yes. it, the experiment that we did at, uh, at the National Library of Medicine at one point was this, what we call information prescription, and I think yeah. others have done yeah. it, but which is that, you know, on a, on a prescription pad, the doctor would, would just um, uh, highlight some of the, in, in, in our case, it was midline plus. You know, check this. You know, check these resources. So you can imagine for your video, you could give people the link um, to uh, you know a web link to those videos, and then they could watch those later. I mean, it's 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 one aspect of the problem, as, right. as you pointed out. There's complexity to it, and it's a it's a ripe area of research. It is. Let's see how you. I, heard heard a, I actually heard a radio ad for the Cancer Centers of America mm -hmm. um, last week that we offer genetic counseling, target treatment. Make right. sure that you get the right cancer centers from America. Right. I mean, which I mean, somebody should be researching them. I don't understand. Why? <laughs> like, you know, Making money get over fifty. Yeah. Uh, we. I just want. Uh, I have to get you back to your event. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Alexa, for being willing to come to Separate Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, thank you.